here today with Nigel Mahoney. Um, Nigel is a, a change agent and an enterprise agile coach and also a leadership coach. Um, he's formerly worked for Cognizant, um, but is currently managing his transition um, to move from the UK back to, back to Australia, which is very exciting. We're very lucky to have you, uh, Nigel, before you move back. Um, and yeah, Nigel's going to talk to us today um, about combining the principles of BBSSH um, with Simon Powers' enterprise change pattern. But I, I won't say any more about that. I'm going to hand over to Nigel shortly. Um, um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. And again, a special thank you for the Sooner Happier, Sooner Safer Happier crew um, for giving me this opportunity. So I want to share you the story, and it's called A Tale of Two Companies, and it's a story about how I managed to overcome the obstacle, which I faced in my coaching career. Um, what I found was when I was working with teams, I could only go so far, and I'd kind of hit this ceiling, and there's a little picture of me hitting that ceiling. And I've continued to hit the ceiling no matter where I was, and it's a ceiling I see that's really common in most companies. Um, so what I'm hoping by sharing this talk and confide you with some valuable insights, so if you're hitting the ceiling too, you can find ways of taking this further. A bit about me. So before we dive deeper, uh, just share a little bit about myself. So I love change, especially in the context of organisational growth and development. Um, I have a young son. And I want a future for him and, and other children where they can honestly say that the culture at their work is somewhere they enjoy being. And um, that's probably my primary driver. So I said, I consider myself a change agent, although I'm not fond of the term. And I'm someone who's deeply invested in facilitating positive change within an organization. So my journey has been shaped by a strong desire to help individuals, teams, companies achieve their best by trusting and empowering their people. So I'm a people first change agent. Um, my career path has been fairly traditional in the world of tech and agile coaching. Started with a degree in computer science, and then from there moved into development using RAD techniques. Became a developer in a Scrum team, a Scrum team where I was introduced to agile methodologies, and then from there I moved to the role of Scrum master. Over time, I was interested transition to agile coaching and enterprise coaching, helping organisations and in particular leadership navigate positive change. Uh, as Anne said, I'm currently working at relocating back to Australia after 20 odd years. I um, I told my parents, I'll, I'm going for two years, be back in two years, see you then. And it's nearly 26, 27 years later. So they're happy to see me come home. I've had uh, the opportunity to work across a variety of industries, including finance, insurance, media, news and consulting. So that just kind of gives you a bit of background. Um, and also, I want to mention my approach to business agility because it, it aligns closely with Sooner, Safer, Happier, which I think is a, a brilliant book. But the only problem I had was with it, it wasn't written 10 years ago when it would have saved me so much heartache. Um, and coming and reading it afterwards, I hope it gets into as many people's hands as possible because it's a really good book. So while not extensive this list, some of the things that I consider important when introducing change into an organization are psychological safety, because it's the very foundation. And without it, organizations can't innovate, experiment, learn from their mistakes, and creating an environment where individuals feel safe to speak up, share ideas, take risks, is, it's crucial. Um, one size does not fit all. Uh, every organization is unique, and so is every team within it. So one size fits all approach to agility, just, it simply doesn't work. And flexibility and adaptability are key. So when someone says to me, let's standardize our, pro our processes, let's make everyone do Scrum, I just absolutely cringe. I find that really, really not good at all. Making work visible. So by making work visible, organizations can better manage their workloads, identify bottlenecks and improve their processes. Uh, which leads on to flow. So flow is about optimizing how much work moves through the system, eliminating waste, reducing delays, and ensuring that the value is delivered continuously. Uh, I believe focusing on outcomes, um, about delivering real value by focusing on outcomes. Teams can ensure they're working on the right things and making meaningful impact. And the, the number of feature factories that I see drives me insane as well. Um, and this hence why we end up with too much work in progress. Defining the why, empowering the how. It's essential to find the why behind the initiative, understand the purpose and the goals, helps teams stay motivated and aligned. 
Uh, and once the why is clear, empowering the teams to figure out how they go about it, give them the autonomy to decide the best way to achieve the outcomes. And finally, I end up in all these with systems thinking. So understanding the bigger picture and recognizing that everything is interconnected. We live in a uh, interdependent world where you can't accomplish anything by yourself. So system thinking helps me identify leverage points for change, ensures the improvements in one area and not creating a problem in another. So with that, the two companies, um, Let's dive into our story. So although the companies came from different industries, finance and media, they were both encountering similar obstacles that were hindering their change efforts. Um, the first being command and control. So one of the primary issues was a command and control structure. Decisions were made at the top, then passed down through the layers of management. And this approach stifled innovation, uh, responsiveness, and that the teams on the ground had little autonomy to make uh, the decisions to adapt quickly. So we found the majority of leadership were operating from what we call the expert mindset. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. Silos, both companies were plagued by silos. So system teams were siloed. Business units, finance, HR, compliance operated in isolation. And there was little collaboration or communication between them. Um, this fragmentation led to inefficiencies and lack of cohesion. Flow, flow was severely disrupted by long cycle times, numerous cues, excessive handoffs. Uh, work moved slowly through the system with many delays and bottlenecks along the way. Improving flow was essential and uh, to achieving that faster delivery and higher quality. And there also project-based mindset was another uh, significant challenge. There were strict deadlines and overwhelming amounts of work. So project-centered approach often led to burnout and focus on outputs rather than um, outcomes, which is kind of productive to true agility. Uh, psychological safety, a lack of psychological safety was a critical barrier, particularly in enterprise level. Uh, while leadership often claimed there was psychological safety, the reality was different. Um, employees did not feel safe to voice their concerns, share ideas or admit mistakes without fear of repercussion. And finally, leadership growth was non-existent. And to be honest, they didn't have time. They were stuck in meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And this created a significant roadblock. And so these problems are not unique to just these two companies. They're coming across so many organizations. And I'm, I'm probably preaching the converted. You've probably all seen this before. So what I'm going to do to provide a deeper understanding of the journey of these two companies that undertook, I'm going to share four case studies. And each of the case studies, the principles were the same, but how we approach them were different. Now, I'm hoping these principles align with the sooner, safer, happier, but you can see how they were affected one company and not in another. So first with the financial institute and then with the media organization. Um, so what were the case studies are defining the why, that's our first case study. And we wanted to find the why, we wanted to ensure everyone understood why the change. So by aligning everyone on the why, we wanted to create a strong foundation, highlighting the importance of a shared vision, gauging stakeholders and securing buy-in and aligning teams on common goals. The second case study examines the role of experimentation and agility. We wanted to create a culture of experimentation. So encouraging organizations to test new ideas, learn from failures and continuously improve. Uh, so this mindset was critical in fostering innovation and adaptability. Um, improving flow was the next one. So identifying limiting bottlenecks, reducing cycle times and enhancing overall efficiency. And finally, we wanted to explore the mindset shift for all of this because it included psychological safety, um, promoting servant leadership and encouraging the mindset. Let's look at the why for financial organization. So, I joined as a Scrum Master before eventually transitioning to an Agile coach. And to be honest, I actually believe an Agile coach, yeah. sorry, a Scrum Master is an Agile coach. Yeah. Uh, like many companies, they wanted some of the good stuff. They wanted to be Agile, but not really know why or how to get there. And as coaches, we took it upon ourselves to explore and to find the deeper reasons behind the need for agility. Um, why did we need to change? Where did the core drivers and the expected benefits? So to effectively communicate the why and engage the teams, we needed to design our approach carefully. We considered various methods to facilitate understanding and buy-in. 
Um, we planned interactive sessions where teams could discuss and explore the reasons for change, predominantly using Sarah Bowman's 4C models for training. We used the engaging activities like Penny Game and Canva Nice to make the learning process enjoyable and impactful. And we explored other innovative ways to reinforce ways to uh, reinforce the importance of agility, ensuring a comprehensive understanding among all team members. Uh, once we had designed what we were going to do, we started running training sessions. We delivered talks explaining the benefits and necessity of agility, and we created team charters to guide the teams to their journey and through educational initiatives. We ensured that everyone who was on the same page and understood the why. So it wasn't enough to just talk about the why, we needed to live it. We worked closely with the teams, continuously looping back to educational content we had provided. And over time, the team started to internalize and embody these values in the daily work. So this ongoing reinforcement was key to embedding agility in the company's culture. Right, experimentation. So next up is experimentation. It's a vital component of agility, and so it enables teams to learn, adapt, and continuously improve. And I'm just going to touch on experiment experimentation in relation to change here and not to product, which is a whole different ballgame. Um, and for our experiment in change, we placed a strong em emphasis on uh, retrospectives as the primary platform. So we utilize various techniques to stimulate creativity and innovation during re retrospectives. So some retro examples are, what should we continue? What should we stop? And what are we going to change? Uh, this simple yet effective method helped teams quickly identify successes and areas for improvement leading to actionable change. Sal and Anchor, um, most of you have probably played it. The exercise helped teams to visualize what was, uh, we still got an issue, was fulfilling items forward, the sale and what was holding them back. The Anchor fostered deep discussion on how to enhance their performance. Five whys, by repeatedly asking why, we dug deep into the root cause of covering underlying problems that needed to be addressed. And finally, future visioning. We asked teams to imagine what was it like in the one year in the future? And describe all the good things that were happening. The exercise helped teams to set aspirational goals and identify them, uh, steps to actually achieve them. So in each retrospective, we focus on implementing one and only one experiment. And this focus ensured that experiments were manageable and the impacts could be clearly assessed. So here are some of the outcomes. So successful experimentation, shifting Test, shift testing left by integrating testing early in the development placement process. We improve quality and reduce late stage defects. Peer program, which fosters better knowledge sharing and code quality. And implementing CI practices help identify issues early, improving overall efficiency. So one that didn't work, the POs insisted that they uh, were the only ones that marked the stories as done. And this, what this actually proved was, was that there was going to be a bottleneck. So let's talk about flow. So the first step in improving flow was to understand the current state. Um, this involved take, talking with product managers and POs, and we wanted to understand the end-to-end -end flow. Mapping out the process, we conducted detailed sessions with teams to stop our existing process, and the visual representation helped everyone to see where the work was getting stuck. So identifying bottlenecks through these discussions, we identified key bottlenecks and areas where handoffs were causing delay. Uh, visual management, we implemented visual management techniques to make the flow of work more transparent. Uh, Kanban boards, so introduced Kanban boards to visualize the flow of tasks. Teams use these boards to track work in progress, identify bottlenecks and manage their workloads more effectively. And regular stand-ups, uh, so people can discuss progress, address issues, and plan the day's work. Um, based on the insight gains, we implemented several changes, we, and which reduced the handoffs and prioritizing work. And finally, how did we approach the mindset? So, and finally, the mindset, the key to it all. If you haven't already, check out Simon's Power, Simon Power's Agile Onion to see why the belief in people is one of the key components of change. Our strategy centered around working directly with people and teams to foster mindset change. Uh, we focused on engaging individuals, understanding their concerns, and involving them from the start. Empowering teams to take ownership of their process, encouraging them to experiment with new ways of working, helped to build the sense of responsibility and autonomy. 
Um, creating a safe environment was crucial. Trust required us building trust within teams. Trust exercises and open communication channels were established to make everyone feel valued and heard. And psychological safety again, encouraging an atmosphere where team members could speak up without fear of judgment or retaliation was fundamental. So this safety allowed for more honest discussions and innovative ideas. Uh, we also did ongoing education workshops were integral to our approach. Uh, we conducted workshops that were highly interactive, involving exercises, games, role-playing scenarios, and these sessions helped uh, teams to internalize the Agile principles through experimental learning. Um, regular training sessions and learning opportunities were provided to keep everyone updated and aligned. Um, finally, we provide support through coaching and mentorship, which was vital, offering no one coaching help, uh, sorry, uh, no one coaching, Offering one-to-one -one coaching helped individuals to navigate their personal challenges and growth areas. And we established a mentorship program where more experienced agile practitioners could guide uh, and support newer team members. So I'm just gonna stop the share there. And I just, I also wanna ask everyone, I feel this was a fairly typical approach. There was nothing unusual about this. Um, would you probably all agree? Nothing unusual about the approach? Yeah, cool. So what changed? Actually, not a lot. Um, while we saw some improvement with teams, we need to acknowledge that they weren't significant in the grand scheme of things, they were siloed. So the positive outcomes were that the teams were, were happier, they appreciate the new processes and the emphasis on collaboration and continuous improvement. However, the effects weren't as widespread or as profound as we hoped for. So despite all these efforts, several significant challenges persisted. Silos, internally the silos disappeared. That's within the systems department, but the organizational silos remained intact and different departments continued to operate in isolation, which just hindered the cross-functional collaboration agility at the enterprise level. Um, projects, where we managed to consolidate some pots of money, the project-based mindset was still dominant means they, you know, they were still setting deadlines, the priority issues were uh, continuous and there were inefficiencies. So flow, there was some improvement in flow of work items, but it wasn't significant enough to transform the overall process from ideation to custom delivery. And many bottlenecks and delays existed. Um, leadership growth, they were just too busy. Um, the usual activities such as attending meetings, uh, the, the lack of involvement stunted the potential for broader organizational change. So command and control, the command and control culture remained prevalent. Decisions were still made at the top and passed down, which stifled innovation and responsiveness at the team level. And finally, psychological safety. It was improved within teams, allowing for better communication and collaboration. However, the improvement didn't extend beyond the teams to the wider organization. There was no significant growth in the leadership's approach to fostering a safe and uh, open environment. So that was the um financial institute so i just want to pause for a second is everyone still good cool take a drink so before we go into the um media company i just want to briefly introduce um the the enterprise change book so for those who are not familiar with it it was previously known as aw playbook and it was um, defined, uh, created by Simon McCree. It's been refined over many years. So it's an agnostic pattern that can be used with any change. And I'm not going to walk you through too much detail, as you can find it on AWA's website. And also, I think Simon does a 20 minute talk where he actually walks through it quite significantly. So when we make a change, um, if you can see down the right hand side, we need to find a reason for change, which is our why. We then need to bring everyone together and with all those that are involved. And it's really important, this must include leadership and the lowest level of leadership should be someone who can make structural change because structural change is what causes your cultural change. It should also go across boundaries as well. So it needs to go across departments that we can break down those silos and form what we call real teams, across department teams. So once you have this all together, what you start doing is then is experimenting and you have an ex or like an experiment stage. So 
In the experiment stage, we understand what is happening now. We define an experiment, make a change and measure. We repeat, rinse, wash, or I should say rinse, wash, repeat. And we'll see this in more detail later as we go through an experiment. So finally, what happens after a successful experiment? Um, this normally results in a structure or process change. And with that results in a cultural change. This then contributes to leadership growth and learning. And if you keep repeating this, you slowly change your organization to be able to make changes like this. So to the media organization. So I was introduced to the enterprise change pattern not long after I began at the media company through AWA's bootcamp. Um, I followed the bootcamp, like I said, with the enterprise cohort where I met some great people. And this created the perfect opportunity to introduce the pattern at the company, the media organization I was working with. So similar to the financial institute, the media organization wanted to adopt agility, but again, didn't fully understand the why. So how, how did we approach the why at the media organization? So firstly, like I said, we identified everyone who would be involved in the change. And this included leadership and the people on the ground or on the teams. And we ran a Lego workshop to create a vision. So splitting everyone into groups, we gave them bags of Lego series play and asked them to build ducks. Now this is an exercise in imagination that helped them understand that Lego was just a form of expression. So we asked the teams to build their organization in its current states, warts and all. So the hands-on activity made it easier for people to articul articulate the challenges and the bottlenecks they were facing and communicate this to one another. The models then served as a focal point for discussions, helping teams to express their thoughts and ideas more clearly. So once they had created that and talked through it, the next thing we did, we said to them, look, we want you now to build how you think you should work. And this exercise helped to align everyone in a common vision. Um, this activity not only clarified the future state, but also served as a foundation uh, for our endeavor to create psychological safe environment where everyone felt comfortable sharing their ideas and concerns. And you need to remember that everyone was included and this is not just a leadership exercise. So the teams need to be there as well because they're buying into it. So with the Lego workshop completed and shared vision, uh, the team identified, identified multiple reasons for change. But the one we changed, uh, the one we chose one of those and restated it uh, as an outcome. And the particular case was the improvement of flow. Now we wanted to bring the group together formally. So we introduced the, uh, what is called a design team alliance or DTA, and this is from Morse coaching. Uh, the created alliance helped them to create an environment where they would need to work together going forward. And we posed this question. We said to them, what do you need from each other for this team to be successful? And we got answers such as honesty, compassion, humility, truthfulness. We then followed that up with the question, when things go wrong, and they're gonna go wrong, you know that, how do you want to be? And some suggestions were things like, we want to be respectful, we want to be honest with one another. We'd like to use SBI feedback, which is situation behavior impact. We want to use radical candor. So going through that, we finally asked them, which of the behaviors are each of them going to be responsible for? And the idea here is that everyone's responsible for the behavior. So when, if you don't see the behavior, you can always refer back. So this exercise puts the focus on how the team will work together. And finally, we wanted everyone to understand what is required for a company to change. And we created a, a game world workshop called Agility, Are You Ready? And in the game, we had a list of stickies dealing good, uh, detailing good practice to enable agility. Uh, they would place the sticky at how important they thought it was and how close to this ideal they were. Now, the, I, the intention of the game wasn't to measure them, but it's for them to have an open conversation and a line of what they thought good was. And that was really, really important. So experimentation, and this goes a little bit further into Simon's pattern. Um, it's the foundation of any change. And I'm gonna walk you through the process of how we go about the experimentation. And the next slide we'll use flow as an example. So we have the right people. We have started to bring the team together using the DTA and the Lego. So the first one we do now is to look at what's happening. 
So there are many tools we can use to see what's happening now within the company. So these include things like value stream mapping, causal loop diagrams, uh, iceberg model and, and future search to name a few. So once the team understand what is happening, they can design an experiment and it should be hypothesis driven and have a true or false outcome. Again, we'll see an example in the next slide. So we then set a duration for the experiment. The team makes the changes and at the end of the period, we, we measure that change. We then celebrate the success and the failures. We are now learning and that's the key we're learning. So and we need to keep experimenting and we're trying to create an experimentation habit within an organization. That's, and that's important because that's what you want. You want them to have that habit. So one thing to note though, it's the team that creates the experiment. So not leadership, and definitely not the coach, but it all needs to be done together, the, the, the leadership with their staff. So- Nigel, we, no. have a question, we have a question in the chat from Karen. You know, I do organizational change management and a facilitator and uh, just was wondering uh, what was the time and number of sessions that you allotted for the great experiment and discovery? Good question. Great question. So uh, it, it really depends, Karen. So something like the value stream management, we did over two days. Um, uh -huh do a proper of some management value stream mapping I should say so we tried to do what the state looks like and we'll go into that a little bit and then what the future state is so that was over a few days other ones can be much quicker you know um, so like we've done ones with whip where the team we spent about an hour just looking at it and say okay let's introduce the experiment and then with the experiment itself again so the, the value stream mapping was a three month one whip we just did it for a couple of weeks yeah this is working let's continue with this so it really depends on the experiment hope that that answers the question yes thank you no worries so what i'm going to do now is going to talk about flow and how we did flow using the experiment so as i mentioned in the previous slide so firstly we looked at what was happening now in this particular case we used the value stream mapping see what the current flow was. And we made sure everyone was involved. And this included the business and, and HR and people like that and, and the team. So it was quite a big exercise, it, um, included cross department and we walked the floor. So we mapped it from ideation to customer. And if I'll let you on a little secret here, the longest queue wasn't an IT, it's never an IT. Um, it was the approval and budgeting cycle. So once we had this information, the team looked at where they could remove cues and handoff. And this was our future, uh, sorry, a value stream mapping future state. The team hypothesized, uh, hypothesized that they moved to the future state and cycle time would improve. We ran a three month uh, experiment and lo and behold, it improved the case. Sorry, it proved to be the case when, when we measured the outcome. Um, as I also mentioned when answering Karen's question, we also experimented with, experimented with WIP, which were a lot quicker uh, experiments. And it should also be noted, you can run multiple experiments at the same time as well. You know, you don't have to be limited to one. So mindset, change in mindset is one of the most challenging aspects of the change. Um, I've already mentioned the HR onion once and I need to mention again, start with the mindset, everything else becomes easier. Um, I used to read it the wrong way and started from the middle where I started from processes, start from the outside. Firstly, everything I've mentioned in the last three slides is contributing to that mindset change, the team alliance, the collaborative approach, the experimentation, uh, the ability to do large scale facilitation and be inclusive. Um, creating the safe space for experimenters to grow, professional coaching, mentoring, the use of Sarah Bowman's four C's to make it fun and memorable. And there's so many tools and techniques. So I should also mention, you need to have faith in the complexity belief as well. Um, but that's a completely different story and just search Dave Snowden. So <laughs> I'll let him deal with that. Um, but there is one critical thing that I haven't talked about and that's leadership growth. So if leadership do not know how to grow, then they'll keep acting in the traditional way. So they'll keep looking at projects, deadlines, output, sticking power, because that's how they're thinking. They haven't grown. So what kind of growth do we need? A few things we introduced. We introduced the fifth discipline or the learning organization, which is Peter Singing's book. 
focus on team learning, shared vision, mental models, personal mastery, mastery and systems thinking. Um, and the concept was that they would become a learning organization. Uh, action logics. Now, I know Kim is going to be happy that I mentioned this one. She's a huge fan of action logics. We use action, log action logics to help leaders understand their developmental stages and encourage their growth towards more effective leadership styles. So this allowed them to transition between what we call the expert achiever and catalyst mindsets. So you can find out more about this in Talbot's Action Logics or Bill Joyner's Leadership 360. Coaching, leadership coaching was provided to support professional development, uh, helping leaders become more adaptive and supportive of agile practice. What was more important, we actually encouraged them to adopt a, a coaching approach to use with their teams. Um, so this moved them a step closer to becoming catalysts and away from their expert mindset. Um, Cantor's four player model, which is a brilliant model for uh, improving communication and interaction patterns, especially within leadership teams, fostering a more collaborative and supportive approach. And uh, what else? Book club. We initiated a book club and um, we started with Russ Laraway's When They Win, You Win, again, about how do you lead teams to encourage the leaders to focus on enabling their team's success uh, as a path of their uh, as a path to their own success. And finally, um, often leaders question their role in any sort of change like this. So how do they fit the new agile paradigm? And it's crucial to support their transition and growth. And probably it's fundamentally the, the hardest and most important thing to do. So the change here and the result, and what was the outcome? So the outcome was one of collaboration, ownership, experimentation, and growth. It was one where the organization could adapt and face anything that was thrown in the path. And it was the beginning of the agility in the learning organization. So in a little bit more detail, collaboration, one of the most significant outcomes was enhanced collaboration. Uh, teams began working together more effectively, breaking down silos and fostering a culture of mutual support. Uh, improved communication channels and practices helped to ensure that everyone was aligned and working towards common goals. Ownership. Another crucial change was the sense of ownership that developed within the teams. The team members felt more empowered to take responsibility for their work and make decisions that you could drive that could drive progress. With increased ownership, there was also a greater sense of accountability, leading to higher quality outcomes and a stronger commitment to the team's success. Uh, experiment and learning. The culture of experimentation and continuous learning become deeply ingrained. Uh, teams regularly experimented with new ideas and processes, learning from both successes and the failures. Uh, the, in, the iterative approach helped to drive uh, constant improvement. So a growth mindset was fostered where learning and development was valued and individuals were encouraged to expand their skills and, and their knowledge. And finally, leadership growth. The leaders were participating in their own grow, growth. And they're actually, like myself, getting a new lease of life. They were enjoying it. They were enjoying that challenge. So what was the key difference? And so firstly, and most importantly, it's the safe space that was a created that allowed the organization to apply the patterns and processes that they need to find their own agility. And to me, this is fundamental for good coaching and it's, it's extremely difficult to, to achieve. But once you achieve it, it allows the organization to own and not rent their agility. They're doing it for themselves and that's what's crucial. That's what gets the buy-in. So they were making the decisions about what they wanted to change. They were all part of creating the change and they were all invested in the change as they were part of it. And yes, at times when, when they got stuck, I would suggest things are done at other places and they may not work here, but it was up to them to decide that they would use my suggestions. There were guardrails. Um, when I could see where things were going wrong, I might ask questions as simple as, how will that work? Or have you considered X, Y, and Z? And finally, we normalize these kind of activities because to most people, these activities feel strange, not used to them. So we say, look, this may feel, feel strange to you. It doesn't feel normal, but give it a go. And, and sure enough, you'll get used to it. And that, that is the big difference. And so I'm no longer showing the teams how to do things. So this is how you do it, Jilly. I let go of the expert mindset myself. And now I'm creating the space for them to discover and experiment what the change can do for them. And that's the catalyst mindset. I think that's really, really important. It's creating that safe psychological space. So finally, 
I'll leave this up, but if you want to do a screenshot or whatever, feel free uh, to capture it. Um, you can check me up on LinkedIn. I have a Substack uh, page. Um, it's called the Change Catalyst Toolkit. And I uh, write about some of the tools I use and how they're helpful and where they can be used. It's had a couple of weeks off at the moment because of my move. Um, and yeah, and then also I've just put up some of the I AWA stuff where I learned um, my, my a lot of my craft. So you can check that out as well. So with that, um, I will hand it back over to Anne. And thank you for bearing with me with our troubles. <laughs>